Ladies and gentlemen, this is an uh, exciting time for Reliable Water Resources. Some of you uh, uh, have seen us last year, and we've come so far in, in the last 12 months. Uh, two major exciting technologies that are under Reliable's umbrella. Number one is we have an oil water separation technology uh, that is allowing us to take recycled uh, frac water and produced water and never have to put it back into the ground again. Uh, the other is we're working on a desalination uh, graphene-based uh, conveyor belt that's going to change how water is going to be taken from seawater to potable water at a very, very cost-effective uh, cost model versus reverse osmosis. This company has two patents. One is on the oil water, oil water separation technology. The other is on the desalination technology, and we're going to talk repeatedly about both of them today. I know this is going to generate a lot of questions in your mind. If you wouldn't mind holding them to the end because we're going to be at the booth later on, we'd be glad to speak to you about any questions that you'll have uh, regarding the technologies. But uh, there's a lot to talk about today. It's going to take me a full 40 minutes to get through the whole story, but I think you're going to agree with me at the end that your time was well spent because there's an opportunity here for our original investors where we truly believe our best beneficiaries are going to be the folks who came with, in with us early because of the story we're about to tell right now. This is a small company. This company was started by some very success, successful oil drillers. In fact, the guy who was the president of the company, Anthony Fiesel, uh, was the gentleman who controlled much of the drilling and the fracking budget for ExxonMobil for the last 28 years in eastern Oklahoma. He also oversaw most of the acquisitions for ExxonMobil in eastern Oklahoma for that period of time as well. But as you know, <clears throat> drillers, oil drillers, ran into one major problem, especially in Oklahoma, and that problem was water. They didn't know what was causing the earthquakes that all of a sudden started taking place in Oklahoma, but for the last 30 months, there's been over 3,000 temblers, tremors, and earthquakes altogether. So much so that by the end of 2016, they had a 5.9 that took place right next to Cushing, Oklahoma, which you know is the epicenter of oil storage and natural gas line storage. Well, Mary Fallon, the governor of Oklahoma, said that that's a matter of national security now, because if that was any closer to Cushing, that would have created a dislocation in our pipelines for natural gas. It would have broken the oil storage containers, and we would have had a major issue in the United States. So what happened was she legislated out of existence 650 of what they call disposal wells. When you drill for a barrel of oil or a cubic meter of natural gas, alongside that barrel of oil or that cubic meter of natural gas comes 3 to 25 barrels of water alongside of it. What do you do with that water since it contains benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene, cadmium, lead, mercury. If you have drilled in the last 100 years in the United States, you take that water and you shove it back into the ground under pressure. Well, that water ruins the aquifer and the water table in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Let me give you an example. Just in one county in Pennsylvania, Demick, Pennsylvania, 243 separate instances of groundwater and aquifer contamination by putting the produced water back into the ground. Mary Fallon, the governor of Oklahoma, shut down 650 disposal wells in and around Cushing, Oklahoma City, and Velma because of the matter of national security. So what do those drillers have to do now? Those drillers can't take their water and put it into a close-by disposal well. So they have to put that water in a truck and they have to take it to parts far and wide, which really eats into their bottom line. And they have to move it geographically far distances, which cost them a lot. Well, let me give you an example. In Oklahoma, drillers bring the water to the disposal well, and they drop it off at the disposal well for 50 cents a barrel. They have to go to another place and buy that barrel of water back because they need water to redrill and refract with. And they need the same water chemistry that's in their borehole. Otherwise, you contaminate the borehole. So we call it 50 cents to drop off the barrel to a disposal well, and they got to buy that barrel back for a dollar. We call it round-tripping a barrel of water for $1.50 in Oklahoma. 
Oklahoma ask Reliable One Resources to go ahead and please bring your recycling technology to Oklahoma. We said we're very much interested in doing that because we can see that there's a major environmental case here in Oklahoma. And as we got ready and prepared to do that, because by the way, Mary Fallon started an organization called uh, the Earthquake Eradication Task Force, which is part of the Oklahoma Corporation Commission, and that was designed to figure out what's causing these earthquakes. Just to fill in the blanks, as you might be saying, well, what is causing the earthquakes? Most people thought it was the fracking, because you know when these guys go and they frack an oil well, they virtually use C4 charges, and they create these interstices and cracks, so that when you drill a horizontal leg to an oil well, and you put all these cracks in there, all of the oil and the natural gas can run into the cracks and then run through the pipeline and back up into your well. Well, the concussive nature of fracking would lead you to believe intuitively that it must be the fracking that's causing the earthquakes. Well, there was four major studies done, one by the United States Geological Survey, one by the Oklahoma Geological Survey, one by the, United, one by the University of Colorado, and one by the University of Stanford. And all of them took four and a half years of painstaking research to figure out what's causing the, these earthquakes. No correlation between fracking and the earthquakes whatsoever. They thought, well, I know that when these drillers try to find where the oil is, they take these 80,000 pound thumpers, they put them at the top of a crane, and they drop those 80,000 pound thumpers and they hit the ground as hard as they can to create these ENP waves, which they try to read, to figure out what's under the ground. Is it oil? Is it natural gas? Is it water? What's on there? Well, that concussive nature of thumping led them to believe it must be part of the cause of the earthquakes. There was zero correlation between thumping and the earthquakes. Every single relative correlation led to the earthquakes being caused unequivocally by putting the frac water and the produced water under pressure back into a disposal well. And you might say to yourself, well, how can that, well, how, well, how, what, what would cause that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the fault lines in the United States they don't lie perfectly horizontal to the Earth's crust. Most of the fault lines lie at an oblique angle, but there's normally enough pressure and there's enough friction to stabilize those fault lines under normal conditions until you introduce a very viscous or slippery su substance such as oily water and you put it under pressure back into the ground. You cause that fault line to buckle and it causes a tremor and a tembler and it results in an earthquake, 3,000 in the last 30 months in Oklahoma. The minute they pulled their the minute they pulled the saltwater disposal wells out of Velma and Cushing and Oklahoma City, you had immediate attenuation of the earthquakes. So we were headed to Oklahoma to go ahead and bring our recycling technology there. Until Memorial Day of last year, week of, we started to receive phone call after phone call after phone call from drillers in the Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania. And they said, we have heard through the grapevine that Reliable One Re Resources has an environmentally safe and cost-effective way of dealing with the frack and the produced water, not by putting it in disposal wells. Is that true? We talked to each one of the major drillers and said, yes, it is. But as we delved closer into the business case, we did not know that the drillers in Pennsylvania were paying between $7.50 and $14.50 per barrel of water that they pulled out of the ground alongside their barrel of water or their cubic meter of natural gas and put it on a truck and they had to cart it all the way over into Ohio because Pennsylvania has shut down all of the disposal wells because it's ruining the groundwater and the aquifer. So that really eats into the bottom line of a driller. So as we got closer into the business case, we said, hey, the highest and best use for reliable right now would be to focus our attention and build our first recycling facility up in Pennsylvania. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are three major locations of oil wells and natural gas wells throughout Pennsylvania. There's 17,456 natural gas and oil wells located throughout the state, pretty much evenly distributed. 6,000 in the southwest, 6,000 in the north central, and approximately 6,000 in the northeast. And each one of them has to take that water and cart it all the way to Ohio, pay $7.50 to $14.50 a barrel. That indicia right here, this data, this comes not from us. This, this data right here comes from the EPA. The EPA says that the cost is between $14 and $16 a barrel to take this water. 
So Reliable One Resources has a technology, ladies and gentlemen, that is capable of recycling the water at a cost-effective price to where you'll never have to put that water back into the ground. They'll literally be able to bring it to our recycling facility, and then once it's finished, we get it down to what they call dischargeable levels, one notch above potable, where you can put it back onto the ground, you can hand it to a farmer, he can put it on a crop, you can release it into a stream, or you can give it back to the driller because the driller wants to re-drill and refrack with it. So, what was the business case in Oklahoma? It was $1.50 to round trip a barrel of water. In Pennsylvania, we've met with these drillers, all the major drillers in Pennsylvania we met with, and we said, what if we put our first recycling facility in Wheeling, West Virginia, right next to all of the location of the Southwest Wells in Pennsylvania? And all the drillers said, that would really work very well for our Southwest Wells because we could just bring the water right over there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we showed our technology to a major funder in the United States, a major well-capitalized U.S. bank, and that U.S. bank said, we want to be part of underwriting these plants. They gave us a full funding commitment letter for $165 million. And that means they want the first right of refusal to put up the first four plants with Reliables technology. And we had to jump through all the hoops of the due diligence. We had to prove the technology. We had to prove the business model. We had to prove the business case, the business plan. Everything was approved. There was one piece of the due diligence that was left in order to procure the money. And that was they wanted to see long-term letters of commitment from the drillers giving us their water, because that takes all the risk out of the equation for the bank. Well, when we went to the drillers and we went back to them and said, we need a commitment letter for you to give us all of your produced water, they said, well, as much as we want to bring all of our produced water to your recycling plant, we have been told over the last six years from no less than six different companies that the technology that you're talking about would materialize, and it never has. Everybody's told us that they could recycle this water, but nobody's ever been able to do it. And may I tell you why? Because the water in the Marcella Shale is 330,000 parts per million of total dissolved solids. Just in contrast, seawater is 34,000 parts per million total dissolved solids. So this water in the Marcella Shale is approximately 10 times saltier than seawater. So any technology that you could think of, membrane technology, reverse osmosis technology, wastewater treatment technology, all those technologies foul out egregiously so when you are trying to put that water in those membranes. We have a robust technology that is capable of treating water that's 330,000 parts per million, bringing it down to dischargeable levels without fouling out. <clears throat> Let me share with you one, one reason why. When you talk about reverse osmosis, reverse osmosis uses four cartridge membranes. They have membranes that they put four of them opposite each other, and by design, they misalign the pores on the four membranes. Then they take massive amounts of electricity, energy, to push volumes of water through those four membranes, and it costs a tremendous amount of money to move that much water through those four membranes. But it actually works. It actually doesn't trap or sequester the sodium, the calcium, the magnesium ions, and the seawater. But because you're doing it with four different membranes with the pores misaligned and you're trapping the sodium chloride and the magnesium ions between them, you create a tremendous amount of sludge. So with reverse osmosis, there's a tremendous amount of operational and maintenance cost in there. There's a tremendous amount of electrical cost on the front end to push that volume of water through the membranes. And if I'm desalinating, if you will, a million gallons of seawater today or this very, very salty water from the Marcella Shale, I need 50% of fresh water to just unclog all the pores in the microscreens. Otherwise, you're going to clog the system on every run. So there are major deficiencies to reverse osmosis, primarily expense. Ladies and gentlemen, our technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current technology of today is so much less expensive than what they're doing in the Marcella Shale. And our number one competitor right now is a company called Veolia. They do the technology for uh, Antero Resources. Antero is a major driller up in the Marcella Shale. They just put a $275 million plant up in the Marcella Shale.
because they have major, major oil and natural gas wells up in the Marcella Shale. They're generating approximately 60,000 barrels of produced water every single day. That technology is called fractional crystallization. It uses two very high thermal events, extremely high heating where you're cracking, and it costs approximately $10.10 a barrel, by their own admission, to purify a barrel of water using fractional crystallization. Reliable One Resources right now, ladies and gentlemen, is cleaning a barrel of this water that's 330,000 parts per million at just under 53 cents a barrel. So we don't think that we have any close competitors, and we think that the business case for us right now, we literally have the opportunity of winning how the water is going to be dealt with in the natural gas and the oil industry. But we want to locate the first plant right in the middle of the Marcella Shale because of the business case that we're experiencing right now. Instead of round tripping a barrel of water for $1.50, what did we get from the energy companies? We said, what if we charged you guys $5 a barrel just to drop the water off to us? They said, how soon could we start? <laughs> so, so we would be getting the water in for $5 a barrel. We would be purifying it. We would sell it back to the driller for another dollar a barrel. That's $6 a barrel. But more than that, this water has the perfect constituency of salt in it for a product called Slicer. Now, if you use a competing technology like a membrane technology, you're trying to use reverse osmosis, when you sequester those salt ions, remember it gets all caught in the middle of those four membranes and it creates a sludge? That's actually called the sludge stream that's generated by reverse osmosis. The way we do it, we preserve the chlorides whole. So the chlorides are very valuable, and if we want to flash the water off and we're left with 350 tons of water for every 10,000, excuse me, 350 tons of salt for every 10,000 barrels of water that we treat, we have a salt distributor that will buy as much salt from us as we can possibly sell them. The 29 states in the north, all the way from Washington State all the way to Maine, they all put salt down on the roads in the wintertime. They charge $64 a ton to put that slicer, it's called slicer or concentrated brine, to sell into the marketplace. So what used to be a contamination stream or a sludge stream has now turned into an income stream. So now we have the tipping fees of, very conservatively speaking, by the way, very conservatively speaking, would be $5 a barrel just to bring the water to reliable, a dollar to sell it back to them, and now we have $64 a ton where we can sell. And by the way, this plant is sized for the Marcella Shale. We've sized it at 20,000 barrels a day. The reason why we sized it at 20,000 barrels a day is because you can obviate all of the trucking miles if you put the plant at 20,000 barrels. There is enough water, 20,000 barrels a day, where you could put the plant right in the middle of the location of the Southwest Wells, and you'll have 20,000 barrels all day long coming to the plant. If you tried to put up a 100,000 barrel a day plant, you couldn't get away from trucking for water in from far and wide, and that gets very expensive and defeats your bottom line. So at 20,000 barrels a day, this plant will generate a net profit to reliable, a net plant profit to reliable of $135 million per year. Now our funder said, we want to put these plants up all throughout Pennsylvania, especially the first one in the southwest, one in the north central, one in the northeast to start with, and you have got a $165 million checkbook to do it. Now, the energy companies weren't ready to write that commitment letter, so we went back to the funder and we said, what if we purchased the trucking companies that have the long-term contracts with the drillers that are currently bringing that water to disposal wells right now? What if we picked out four of the major trucking companies that have the contracts to pick that water up and bring it to the disposal wells right now? They said that would ratchet up our comfort level significantly. Yes, we'll give you the checkbook to do that. And then we said, well, what if we bought one of the major disposal wells up in Ohio that's right close to all these Marcella shale wells where a lot of these drillers are bringing the water currently that have contracts from the drillers to bring the water to the property? They said that would ratchet up our comfort level another notch. Go ahead and buy that. So we went out on a due diligence shopping spree, and we put under letters of intent to buy the exclusive right to buy one of the major saltwater disposal wells in Ohio. This saltwater disposal well 
processes up to 4,500 barrels of frack and produced water every single day. The four trucking companies that we're talking about, they control 14,500 barrels a day worth of water that they have contracts with the drillers. So we have approximately 19,000 barrels under contract ready to come to our plant. We plan to put this first plant up and break ground in the first quarter of 2019. Now, one of the most enhancing things and heartening things for our investors about this business case is that Ohio just made the decision that they want to go from 13% of their electricity produced from natural gas-fired plants to 28% of electricity provi provided by natural gas-fired plants in lieu of providing electricity via the very pollutive coal-fired plants. So there is a big push right now to get more natural gas drilled for in Pennsylvania so that they can bring it to the Ohio natural gas-fired plants, which, by the way, are going to be online in the first and second quarter of 2019. This is going to require a massive extra amount of natural gas delivered to the natural gas-fired plants that are now coming online, $9 billion worth of natural gas-fired plants coming up in Ohio. We want to be there, ladies and gentlemen, with that first plant ready to go and receive that water by the second quarter of 2019. That's a tremendous amount. Now, along with that natural gas that's going to be coming out of the ground, you've got an, an attendant amount of water that's going to be hitting the marketplace as well. So we think that our biggest challenge is going to be the minute we put the first plant up, that the governors who have already legislated the disposal wells out of existence in Pennsylvania and Cushing, Oklahoma, and Velma, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma City, by the way, these earthquakes, they're not limited to Oklahoma. The earthquakes have now reached up into Kansas. There's been over 200 earthquakes in Kansas. It's actually reached up into Ohio, so much so that Ohio has now put a moratorium on produced and frack water coming across state lines into Ohio. So the drillers are saying to themselves, what am I going to do with the water uh, that I have when I drill for a natural gas and I drill for oil if the disposal wells get shut down? So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we're very positioned. We're at the right time with the right technology because this is a win-win-win. This is a win for the environment. This is a win for the E&P drillers. It's going to save them a lot of money. And this is a win for reliable shareholders because we are so much less expensive than the current technology that's out there right now. Um, we're looking to put that first plant up. Uh, it takes about six months for that plant to be operational. It'll break ground in the first quarter of 2019. It'll be operational in the uh, second quarter of 2019. And our chief financial officer for Reliable One Resources is Richard Barber. Richard Barber is the former chief financial officer of Bank of America. Richard preaches to us one mantra constantly, Wall Street salutes one major company trait over all others, and that's a small stock float with a significant income stream. Reliable One Resources only has 11 million shares outstanding. We have, a ma we have managed to avoid all the highly dilutive uh, private equity and venture capital money. We have done all of our operations, all of our patents, all of our fabrication, all of our R&D, all of it's been done on the back of our individual partners. They come in and they buy the stock. We plan on doing an IPO in the second quarter of 2019. Why? Because that's when the first plant will be online. Wall Street is very good at connecting the dots once you have your first plant up and running. Once you see that your second plant is staged and ready for deployment and your third plant is staged to ready to deployment and you already know that you're making $135 million net income on your first plant, you've only got 11 million shares outstanding, that's a business case that I think you guys can understand leads to a very good outcome for our original partners. I think our original co partners are going to be our best beneficiaries. So that is where we're headed with our oil water separation technology right now. We did not know, however, that the same scientists that we hired for the oil water separation technology were working on a desalination technology as well. And they were working a little bit out of the box, admittedly, on this desalination technology. They were working with a medium called graphene. And they introduced this to us and said, graphene is a very interesting medium. It's 200 times the tensile strength of steel, and yet it's semi-permeable. So it lends itself very well to a desalination medium. But the key is, could you get 
the pores in this material to be standardized so that you could get the select permeation of some molecules and the rejection of all others, and that was the goal. And fortunately, to make a very, very long R&D study sh short, we have now gone through the R&D process with the number one scientist in the world that worked under no Dr. Anton Devosilev, the gentleman who won the Nobel Prize for inventing uh, graphene. This gentleman has uh, got his own laboratory in India, and they have coded our patented desalination unit with a graphene belt, which is a membrane that sits at the bottom of a conveyor belt that runs continuously at the bottom of the chamber. So unlike reverse osmosis, that has a tremendous amount of kilowatt intensity, graphene is super hydrophilic. It loves the H2O molecule. But I'm going to tell you something very arcane as far as the science, and I think you'll appreciate it. When graphene first came out, the way that they created the pores was you create graphene by heating methane gas at 1,000 degrees Celsius. You put a copper foil behind the furnace, and something very amazing happens. These carbon derivative molecules start to self-assemble on this carbon foil in hexagonal crystalline matrices that are extremely strong structures, 200 times the tensile strength of steel, yet they're semi-permeable. But the key was, could you get the pores in the graphene standardized. Let me give you one permutation and you will connect all the dots. The molecular diameter of the H2O molecule is 0.289 nanometers. The next molecule up the chart, if you will, is the carbon dioxide molecule. It's 0.331 nanometers. So our goal was to get the pore sizes in the graphene to be a third of a nanometer. Finally, we have a partner, a strategic partner, that was able to break through and give us that graphene-coated belt at a third of a nanometer. That means that the only thing that goes through the belt is the H2O molecule. The carbon dioxide molecule gets rejected off the top, as do all the sodium, the calcium, and the magnesium ions. So after every run of seawater, we have an air knife that's on the side of the belt that pushes the chlorides off the top into its own separate vat. They have been preserved whole, so they own have their own separate income stream. But the key here is you don't need all the electrical energy to push that volume of water through four different membranes that have the pores misaligned. You don't have a middle that's creating all the sludge, so you don't have the operational and maintenance costs of the RO. And you don't have a back end because there isn't any sludge in the middle that you have to backwash with 500,000 gallons of fresh water if you're desalinating a million gallons of seawater today. So you obviate all the deficiencies of RO with Reliable One's desalination solution. To be candid, we've done this at the laboratory level in one meter by one meter swaths of graphene right now. But the good news is this. We've been able to adhere the graphene to our conveyor belt. That was a monumental challenge. We thought that was not going to be easy. We, we didn't think that was going to be hard. We have combed the globe and used six of the most famous graphene depositional research labs in the world to try to adhere the graphene to our conveyor belt, none of them could do it. The last la lab we took it to said this, we know one person in the world that knows more about graphene than anybody else, and that was Dr. Rahul Nair that worked under Dr. Anton Navasilev who won the Nobel Peace Prize for creating graphene and inventing it at the University of Manchester in 2004. We sent it off to his lab in India, Three weeks later, they sent us back an email and said, we've been able to adhere the graphene to your conveyor belt. So we've been able to do it in one meter by one meter swaths so far. In fact, we have um, the test actually results on the one meter by one meter. And the way that they describe the RO membrane is called the triacetate polyamide uh, membrane. That triacetate polyamide membrane uh, got a rating of 10 on the water flux when we did it at 225 PSI. We ran the water through the graphene membrane. We ran the water through the RO membranes at 225 PSI. And the graphene membrane got a rating of 79 of water flux, which means it was approximately eight times more efficient at letting the H2O molecule through than the triacetate 
polyamide membranes for RO. It also was significantly better, four times better, on salt rejection. So it rejects salt better than RO. It, it imbibes water only better than RO. And it is approximately one-eighth to one-ninth the cost of reverse osmosis because you're only using 225 PSI one time. In reverse osmosis, ladies and gentlemen, you have three separate pressure events, one at 400 PSI, one at 800 PSI, and the final one at 1600 PSI. That's why there's so much electricity needed to push that water through an RO. In fact, in Carlsbad, California right now, they have, what, uh, a, a 200 million a gallon a day plant in Carlsbad right now, but it's far over budget and it, it's far behind schedule and it's not going to work out because it's just too expensive to do it. So we have requests from all around the world right now, 14 countries that border um, the ocean in Africa, all 14 countries they want an RO system from Reliable. All of the countries in the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, all want the system. Every country in the Caribbean under the CARICOM banner, all the cruise lines, Royal Caribbean, Carnival, uh, Nor Norwegian Cruise Line. By the way, when you have a cruise ship, they tell you how much fresh water they need in tons per day. This ship needs 26 tons of fresh water per day. And they all use RO. But it's enormously expensive. So ladies and gentlemen, we really believe this. Our next R&D is to take going from one meter by one meter, we are now going to take it to our patented desalination unit, which has a conveyor belt that's 34 inches wide by eight feet long. That's our demonstration size unit. We are coating the belt. We have the ability to coat the belt now in-house. Reliable has its own graphene depositional capabilities. We will coat the belt ourselves and we will take it to the number one lab in the United States in Fredericksburg, Virginia that does all the pressurized testing for the United States space program and we'll ask them to tell us what is the exact flux rate when we're doing it 34 inches long wide by eight feet long on a continuously moving conveyor belt. So if we can get the jump between running the water through our one meter by one meter graphene coated conveyor belt strip and we can transfer that to 34 inches wide to eight feet long as it continuously runs at the bottom of our desalination unit, which is a patented process that Reliable owns, then we believe that we'll change the paradigm on how seawater is going to be changed to potable water in the United States. And that is a big space. Um, there's 22,000 desalination plants worldwide. Most all of them are reverse osmosis. If they're not reverse osmosis, they are multi-stage flash distillation units. In combination with reverse osmosis, multi-stage flash distillation is slightly more expensive than RO. So you see the reason why everybody's looking for a better way to get water from, fresh water from seawater. We're not that far away, I don't think. Uh, I don't, can't tell you exactly how long it's gonna take, but I think we're farther and closer than anybody else is right now. But as sublime as that is, and as philanthropic as that endeavor is, and, and, and bringing fresh water to the world at an affordable level is, is indeed those two things, can I tell you that it would be hard to match the profitability of the plants that we'll be able to put up for our oil water separation technology? Because there are 38,169 disposal wells in the United States right now and they're all putting the frac water and the produced water in the ground because up until now, if you wanted a barrel of water, uh, a, a barrel of oil or a cubic meter of natural gas, that was the only game in town. Well, now things are completely changed. Now, we've talked to the EPA officials, we've talked to the governors, and we really believe that once the first plant is up and running in West Virginia, then the governors and the EPA officials are gonna say, hey, no more disposal and injection wells. There's a cost-effective, environmentally safe solution to do this. So I think at that point, our biggest challenge is gonna be how many of these recycling facilities can we put up, put up right now because there just aren't any downside, uh, downsides. It, it's, a, it's a win, 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 win. So I'd like to ask you this question. With two billion gallons of water every 24 hours, 
in the United States going back into the ground, Reliable could put these plants up one after another and change the whole paradigm of not ruining the aquifers and not creating the earthquakes. So we know that if a technology can execute and they're first to market, they have the opportunity to win 80 to 85 percent of that market. There's a trillion gallons every single year that are irretrievably lost from the potable cycle because they just pump it back into the ground under pressure as noxiously as you can imagine. This will change everything. So this is not just a financially rewarding opportunity, ladies and gentlemen. This is an impact investment for the United States. So I'd like to make this business case to our partners right now. How often have you seen where 100% of the winds on the supply side and the demand side are blowing in the direction of your enterprise, of your enterprise solution? It's, it's very rare. But think of it this way. On the demand side, Reliable has the only technology right now that is environmentally friendly and cost effective to deal with this contaminated water. On the supply side, you have the current technology being legislated out of existence. So once the first plant goes up, I think that we're going to be in the position where our, our original partners who bought the stock at $1.50, and if one of our 20,000 barrel a day plants yields a net profit to the plant of $135 million a year, then you along with Wall Street can connect the dots as to what the opportunities for our original partners. So we're going to put the due diligence package together over the next two weeks. Our CFO right now is working on the due diligence package right now, even as we speak. When he puts the due diligence package together, um, Sam is related to our CFO. <laughs> uh, uh, when he puts the due diligence package together, we bring it up to our funder in Downers Grove, Illinois, at the end of May. Once they sign off on that, it takes them 60 days to fund. So Reliable will be able to put up as many plans as it needs to within the first year. So I want to make the opportunity available to our, our money show attendees right now. We would like you guys to come to the table and say, hey, <clears throat> I have my questions about the technology, I have my questions about the business case, but I, d I definitely would like to participate in reliable stock. We make it as easy as possible. The same stock transfer agent that we use right now when our folks buy our private stock is the same stock transfer agent we're going to use when we do our public offering. All our folks do is buy the private stock now when we do our public offering in the second quarter, uh, planned for the second quarter of 2019. They just exchange their private shares for the QCIP number public shares. That's the plan. Right now is to be public by the second quarter of 2019 because that income stream will be online in West Virginia. So arguably, I believe that our original shareholders are going to be, be able to participate in two of the most valuable patents that exist in technology today, the oil water separation patent and the desalination patent. We have the oil water se separation plant ready to go and break ground in the first quarter of 2019. And we will keep all of our partners updated on how we get to that next jump and scale and take it to uh, fruition in our 34 inches by 8 foot long uh, patented desalination unit. And once, once, uh, once we uh, are successful in that technology, our original partners will be first to know. But if we never, if we never had a desalination technology, if you connect the dots with how profitable our oil water separation technology is, I think that you'll, think, you'll, you'll agree with me that our, our original partners are going to be our best, be best beneficiaries. So you guys have been tremendously considerate to, to choose Reliable One Resources at 1045 because there were some very provocative other folks I know that were talking at 1045 this morning, and, and you guys decided to spend your time with us. So we're going to try to deliver uh, exactly what we talked about today to all of our original partners. Please meet us at booth. Four, four, we're at booth 400 today. We have a brochure. In the brochure, you can read a lot about the technology that we talked about today. Right behind our brochure is our very simple stock subscription agreement. It's two pages. Say, I'm a accredited investor. I'd like to buy reliable shares at $1.50. 
you'll be able to do that for the next two to three weeks. We're still offering it at $1.50 right now. Once we go up and we meet with the funder, they sign off on the package, well then obviously everything's going to change. So we thank you so much for visiting us again at Reliable One Resources. Please come to booth number 400, sit with us, visit with us, ask all the questions you'd like to. We'll spend all the time you need to satisfy your interest, but let's go forward together. Let's hold hands. Let's change how this water is going to be dealt with in the oil industry and the natural gas industry, and let's try to bring this desalination technology home where we're going to be the ones who are going to bring affordable desalination to the world. Thank you guys so much for attending with us today. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, most of you.